Um, for what we we know will be very interesting um, talk. Um, Irish Uplands Forum has always been very interested in in farming and land management to the uplands. And uh, I think about five or six years ago, we tried to um, um, make an application to life for uh, a project, you know, looking at upland land management. And it didn't get anywhere. But so we're delighted that, you know, Mm -hmm. this project is now coming about um, a large scale integrated project. Um, And uh, we're delighted then to, to have Gary talk to us tonight about this. Um, Gary's background is in, I suppose, community development, sociology. Um, He got an MA from UCG and then followed that up with a PhD in 2016. And since then, he's worked on various, uh, I suppose, research academic projects in UCG. Um, Until now, he's he's working um, as part of the team delivering um, the life project. Um, so it's really great to um to hear directly from from Gary about how the project is getting on and what they hope to hope achieve from it. So Gary, could I uh, could I pass over to you now, please? Yes, thank thanks very much, Mary, and you have the introduction done for me and everything. And thanks, Deirdre, and thanks to everybody for coming. And I'll do this. Merry dance with this screen sharing now and stuff and see hopefully it all goes fine. That's good, Gary. We can see it. Um, uh, okay, we should be away. So perfect. So um so the other thing I suppose you didn't say say about me is uh, where where I'm from and where I grew up. And I suppose that kind of background is important as well in terms of kind of well the philosophy and everything else but i'm uh, i live in westport in mayo and uh, born and raised just outside the town on a small farm um so i've been not not in the uplands but i've been you know uh working on a farm on and off as well um all my life i suppose standing in gaps and, and driving factors and, and whatever else help help needs uh, to be done and I'm also actually gone back to college for my fourth degree, and now I'm halfway through a master's in agricultural science in UCD for my for my mm-hmm. STEM. So I'm gone into agriculture in a big way. Some might say, and others might say, I'm too long looking at books, and I'd want to get on with doing something. But <laughs> anyway, you can you can take what what you want. So the project Wild Atlantic Nature. I guess the presentation tonight is. Um, it's nearly a two-parter in some ways in in uh, so far as I'm going to spend, I guess, the first half or so talking about what we have done over the last two years. And then I will speak about how we're building on that. And we're kind of, I suppose, in a way, we're entering a new phase of the project now based on the back of the new CAP strategic plan and um, nature restoration law and all the other all the other things that are happening, you know. So um, so I kind of take you through now. Some of you will be well familiar with some of the stuff and others it will be new. So I'll we'll try and keep it at a level that can kind of bring everyone up to speed. So apologies if if I bore you in some sections um, or, or otherwise. And, and indeed, some of you might have heard a lot of this stuff before. I see Helen and others who we've been liaising with along, along the way as well. So just a background to um, the life project Wild Atlantic Nature. It is a long project, like it's nine years in duration, which is, you know, it's um, it's it's very unusual, I suppose, for a single project to uh, be so long. But it's part of this life integrated program. So the life program in itself is a funding stream from the European Union for climate and environment projects. And, uh, you know, it's one of 20, 20 something funding streams, the Common Agriculture Policy and others, the Horizon Programme and whatnot. There's there's different avenues, but the LIFE Programme funds climate and environment projects. There's been, um, it started in 1992 and they funded over 5,000 projects. So Ireland were actually very slow on the uptake of getting LIFE funding until recently, really. We didn't have that awful many LIFE projects. But the European Commission in 2012 bought in this new style of project called an integrated project. So 
whereas the traditional life project would be uh, run for a shorter duration and you would write your proposal and say you're going doing X, Y, and Z. And if you get approved, then you've got to do exactly what you promised you would do. The integrated project is a, a um, relatively, well, a newer version, which is a bigger, longer project that's, I guess, more ambitious in a way, but the idea is that the project addresses some requirement by member states at the EU level. So you're talking about, you know, assisting the delivery of major kind of policy pieces or, you know, frameworks that, that are required. And uh, to do that, the, you get a longer time and then you get a, a bigger budget, I suppose, as well. So um, the other kind of two key aspects is that the... Uh, encourage that all the kind of managing authorities for whatever your target is are partners on the project or as many as possible and then the final kind of difference as well with the traditional project is that there's a remit to bring in complementary funding into the project so you start off with your with your core budget and on that you're expected to bring in additional funding to you know, upscale, scale up, scale out, whatever, whatever is working well and to, you know, you know, a flow and adapt along with the changing circumstances. So having said all that, our project is from 2021 to the end of 2029. So we're still in year three of the project. So we're not a third of the way through yet. And we have a budget starting off of 20.6 million, of which 60% comes from the European Commission and 8.3 from the project partners, of which there are 10. So the project itself is coordinated by National Parks and Wildlife Service with nine other partners. Uh, and you'll hear about some of the work of those later on in the presentation. But the, the big picture, I suppose, of the project then is assisting in the delivery of the prioritized action framework, which is the management of the Natura 2000 network, which um, all of you will, will probably know is the special areas of conservation and the special protection areas, which are designated under the EU birds and, and habitats directives. So for us, that's, that's the kind of big picture, but then of course there's 400, 400 and something SACs in the country, um, which would be too much to handle for any project and uh, so our focus is on the blanket bog SACs which were identified as you know needing some 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 assistance I suppose to put it that way so we're based in the northwest of Ireland and there's 35 blanket bog SACs come under the project um, when we look at the kind of area that comes under the project it's uh, it's from South Galway down at the Sleeve Octis up to North Donegal so it's pretty big and over over to Colcanir and SAC and Leitrim Cavan area. So it's it's a pretty big area. It'll be the Northwest Regional Assembly area, in fact, on, the, on that level. But um, there's about two hundred and sixty thousand hectares of land. And then if we look at that that particular land that comes under the project, there's over eighty percent of that is privately owned and actively farmed. So, I mean, if we want to do anything about the conservation, restoration of our blanket bog habitats, then it, it, of course, makes sense that farmers in the project area should be our number one target. And that's what we firmly set out to do is to work with farmers and local communities. I mean, like other other projects would would often target state lands and kind of demonstrate actions there, et cetera. But it'll, it'll only get you so far. And, you know, in an Irish context, if you want to make, make change at the large level, you really got to work with farmers as the kind of front front line of conservation efforts and the people who can actually deliver what you what you uh, require and the, the outcomes that you require to benefit from all. So. Um, so the, the, when we when we consider that you know, trying to work with farmers and then we consider, well, like what's what and the, the state of our SACs, the conservation status, which, you know, is is poor in a lot of cases, then we ask ourselves, well, what's driving the kind of actions on the ground or what's driving the, the outcomes or the condition of the of the blanket bogs that we see on the ground? And often the kind of issues are at the organizational institutional level and they can often be uh, trace back to different policies and what policies are incentivizing and a lot of the times you'll find that we've got several different land use policies that are 
running at the same time, but they're not necessarily pulling in the same direction. So we've got, you know, a water policy, we've got a biodiversity policy, we've got a climate policy, we've got an agriculture policy, et cetera. And they're often incentivizing different behaviors or different management of the land. And, you know, as a result, we often see damage on the ground because landowners and land managers and others, they, they're not sure which way to turn. You know, one day it's do this, the other day it's do, do that. And somebody is saying one thing and somebody else is saying something else. And, you know, you end up with mixed messages. And ultimately, the the, the farmer, the landowner is, is a bit lost sometimes in it all. And, you know, there's no kind of coherence or kind of a one direction so you know we know the issues very well the, the decline in water quality the decline in biodiversity the increase in carbon emissions and the decline in the conservation status of our de designated habitat so generally trends are going in the wrong direction so i suppose the first uh, objective is to slow down the rate of decline before you talk about delivering any kind of pristine habitats or, or anything else so, you know, to kind of build on our, if we could sum up the key objective of the project, I suppose in a sentence, we'd be looking to deliver high quality habitats that are sensitive to the local context that deliver for the environment, farmers and local communities. And I think that kind of dual benefit, if you want to call it that, is absolutely vital here that all the actions that we do in the project are all, you know, that we, we try that they have got this social benefit that the farmers, the landowners are benefiting from what we're doing or what they are doing with us, but it also is delivering an environmental benefit because if you have don't have both of those factors at the same time, then you know what what you're doing will ultimately fail because if you have the environmental benefit but it's not working for farmers, forget about it. You won't get the buy-in. You won't have the people that can deliver what you want. And if the farmers are benefiting, but the environment's not improving, then the taxpayer, the funders, et cetera, even the farmers themselves, in fact, won't continue it either. So, you know, it's very important that we've got this social benefit and the environmental benefit fr from the actions. And then I just put together a, a little Venn diagram there to show how we try and maybe tie together some of the complexities, because we know it's a very, very complex issue, nature conservation. And... Well, anything involving people is complex, you, you might say, um, because we're inherently complex ourselves. But when you look at policy, as I said, you've got several different policies that come into play here with how the land is managed. And then you've got the practices that we see on the ground. So when we drive through these areas or spend time in there is what do, what do we see happening? You know, we see farming, we see forestry, we see tourism, we see turf cutting, whatever it may be that's going on, you know, whatever kind of industry businesses as well. And, you know, they are some, somehow supported by different policies, which, you know, benefit or kind of incentivize certain practices and support certain practices and maybe deter others. And then if we look at the place, you know, in terms of the nature, the environment, the communities that are there, the culture, the tradition, the heritage as well, this all kind of uh, sh shapes the, the practices that can occur there and vice versa, the practices shape the people, you know, so the people shape the landscape and the landscape shapes the people and it's all un underpinned by policy. So there's a lot of different factors at play that need to be considered, I guess, in terms of the conservation restoration. But, you know, luckily in our project, we weren't uh, starting from, from scratch and we were able to build on a lot of great work that has happened over the last 30 odd years or so uh, with farmers and in, with sustainable land management and um, particularly with different agri-environment programs um, and based on this results-based model. Um, so we've had, you know, from the burn program right through to the Pearl Mussel, Hin Harry, or those North Connemara EIPs and others down the McGillicuddy Reeks and that um, we're, we're, we have, you know, they've been working with groups of farmers in different areas uh, using a results-based approach to deliver environmental outcomes in ways that works for farmers. So we have already the ingredients of what a good successful agri-environment program should look like. And you know, I guess these kind of bullet points here could be applied to any kind of sustainable initiative, really. I think there's something that you could speak to anything, be it a transport project or a, a food project or energy project or whatever. But 
essentially uh, the project should be locally adapted so that it works for the local context. It needs to be practical and needs to be results focused. So everybody is on the same page in terms of what, what, what you're looking for as outcomes and outputs. Uh, developed with local people to make sure you've got input from farmers, communities, etc. It's got to be properly and fairly funded. You know, the money has to be there. It has to make sense. Uh, facilitate flexible and adaptive management so that there's options there for farmers that they, they're they not forced or, you know, no mandatory kind of actions on them that they can have the flexibility to farm as they wish and adapt to, to the program to suit themselves. Um, all the while building local trust and capacity is vital and facilitate improvements whereas a farmer wants to do something to improve the situation then that the options are there the supports are there be it technical financial administrative supports whatever it may be and that the the project accounts for factors outside of the farmer's control so that you're not penalizing a farmer or, or, or something that they have no control over so they must be able to have control of their own destiny make their own choices etc so on the back of these results-based projects we we developed our own one adapted to blank bog habitat in the uplands and i guess the the main idea behind the results-based program some of you would be very familiar with them but the farmer joins the program and the each field the farmer has gets a score of between zero and 10 based on the ecological quality of the habitat, uh, which is determined using a scorecard. So the scorecard picks up uh, things like levels of biodiversity, water quality, water filtration, climate regulation, and other threats and pressures on the site. Um, the the score then is related to the payment the farmer receives. So the higher the score on the ecological quality, the higher the payment the farmer receives. So farmer payments are directly related to ecological quality. Um, so you know what what this does, I guess, is it aligns some of those policies we talked about earlier. So you have it on a single scorecard, you've got a, a system that can deliver for clean water, for biodiversity, for climate, and it can put money in farmers' pockets. So um, it's really, really a nifty little tool in order to kind of, you know, overcome that tug of war situation I showed earlier and have everyone kind of going in the same direction. And so, you know, for us, we would have had input from all the different uh, policymakers in these different aspects and different experts in the design of the scorecard and the verification. Say, you know, does a high score on this card deliver for what you need for, you know, be it the water framework directive or the biodiversity action plan or whatever, it is, whatever it may, the case may be, you know, so we would have got good buy in there as well as the farmers um, feeding into the design so that, you know, it was something that they could work with as well. So what we uh, what we've done is used a whole farm approach. So you don't just pick and choose, you know, to bring in the blanket bog or the peatland or a field here or a field there, but the whole farm comes into the program within a defined target area. So we had three scorecards for uh, far for peatland, grassland, and woodland, and we we're paying the same rates on all three habitat types, so that you don't incentivize the destruction of uh, one habitat over over another and also because you know every farm is managed as a whole farm so how the uplands are managed depends on how the lowlands is managed like every farmer will have some green land or some inside land and they'll have some common edge and they manage it all as a single system so it's very important that you take the whole the whole farm into consideration there so the way we've done it is targeted on the on the landscape level. So we target the SAC that's designated for blanket bog and then the catchment around that. So we go on the hydrological catchment as well. Um, and we basically defined our target areas. We had uh, six special areas of conservation in our pilot program. And everyone, every farmer inside that red line of the target area was was uh, able to apply for the program. Uh, so, you know, rather than just dotting around a farm here, a farm there to demonstrate, you know, if you want to have, you know, widespread change, you need to do it at the catchment level and have everybody kind of managing the, the, whole, the whole catchment as one system in a way with all the ecological connectivity, et cetera, that's uh, very important as part of the uplands. So we had a, a 
good uptake of about 85 percent um in the in the target areas which is pretty pretty impressive so there was a lot of um meetings with farmers at the initial stages etc to get their inputs opinions but once they started to sign up they came in their droves so there was huge um huge um interest from the farmers and being part of the program and so what you end up with then is a, a huge amount of data on the kind of condition of the uplands which allows us of course to a pay the farmers for ecosystem services for delivering what you know the taxpayer and what the public are, are demanding which is clean water biodiversity uh, carbon storage sequestration etc but it also then uh, lets us gives us a good understanding of the threats and pressures even at the, the micro level at the field level across the entire SAC so that then we can you know go and seek funding and develop plans to to um, improve the condition of these areas as well with the farmers who who are interested there. So there is what Owen Duffnaif and SEC there, and like every red dot there is a scorecard that was scored in, in a particular field. So the advisor would go in and uh, walk walk the field, go through the scorecard on their app, and uh, the each field gets a score. Um, take a photo and uploads directly to our system, and it you know calculates the farmer payment directly off. But you know so. It's a very nifty system and it gives us loads of baseline data for, you know, being a, in a position to deliver restoration for those farmers who are interested in, in being involved in that. And of course, a really important aspect is this idea of incentivizing improvement and having the facilities to improve. So while the results based payment is paying farmers for the ecological condition on that given day, we also have a budget for restoration actions or supporting actions, whatever you might call them. So actions a farmer might take to improve the uh, ecological conditions. So it might be, you know, water table management, it might be invasive species control, it might be, you know, solar pumps, it might be riparian margins, a bit of fencing, a livestock crossing, whatever. I think we had about 200, we have a list of about 200 different actions that we'd support or either fund outright or co-fund along with the farmer. So again, they are completely voluntary for the farmer to, to take up those actions if they wish. And, you know, with their advisor, they'd make a plan, come to us, we'd approve it and, and pay. And ideally, you know, the farmer would do the work themselves where possible and, and be able to get that money for, for labor for themselves. So these actions then assist, you know, with the better farm management, improved ecological quality. There's just some photos of some, you know, drain blocking, they used to call it, I think they're they're calling it water table management now, but anyway, whatever, it's the same, it's the same outcome, but those two farms are in the Pearl Muscle Project, and like the most interesting thing in many ways, apart from the ecological improvement, is that the farmers in both of those situations would say that by, um, you know, installing those uh, drains, or blocking those drains, that there was no loss of productivity on their farm, they could still hold the same amount of stock, et cetera, on the farm. So it didn't make any difference. The drains weren't really improving agricultural productivity anyway, but they were having a pretty severe impact on the environment in terms of, you know, carbon emissions and water quality. Um, and they would be draining into Pearl Muscle rivers that, you know, are really sensitive to changes in conditions, uh, et cetera. So a huge part of the whole thing as well is training and knowledge. And, you know, it's training with farmers so that you go through the scorecard training and farmers understand what their scores are based on and what their payments are based on and how they can improve condition. But also training with the managing authorities, with departments, with policymakers, um, with others, you know. So uh, we would have spent a lot of time with all the various government departments and we had several groups over from different countries in Europe to visit the project to look at the results-based program and how it works and looking at maybe how they could adapt it for their own their own countries as well. And uh, I suppose recently we started more in the training around the restoration processes. We see, we see reprofiling there of old turf banks and geotextile on bare soil patches, uh, rhododendron control, and there's a, an eddy covariance tower there on a demonstration farm where we're, we're capturing the carbon emissions. And, you know, it's, it you know, the more the farmers are aware of these different data and techniques and everything, the more support you will get from farmers along the way. 
and of course the you know national parks department of agriculture and others as well who there's a real need for the training there and then the communication dissemination is vital as well pat might recognize some of his ifa colleagues down there in the bottom right hand side and uh you know we've been we've in the top left there is the European Commissioner for the Environment, uh, Virginia uh, Savinkujus or something. He's a um, Lithuanian man who came over to, to visit the project. And on the back of that, we were invited over to Brussels to present at EU Green Week and et cetera. You know, we've had several ministers down and we've been in papers and we've been on television in Portugal and on RT and everything else. But... <laughs> You know, actually, the most important meetings we always have and always will have is with the farmers and particularly with the farmers on their land. When you go and walk the land with the farmer, talk about the issues, talk about what can be done, etc. And that's that's where the real the real important stuff is done. That's where you get the buy in. That's where the change can be made in the ground, because at the end of the day, if the farmer says no, uh, to to doing some work on their land and it's it's game over you know you can have all the meetings with as many commissioners as you want but if the farmers aren't on board you can forget about it uh the other stuff's important too of course in terms of funding but so like just in in kind of summary the our results-based pilot ran from 2021 to 2022 with 823 farmers across eight special areas of conservation um, we trained over 50 advisors to score the lands for their, their own cli uh, clients, etc. It was 63,000 hectares of land and we paid over 3 million euros directly to farmers for ecosystem services. And we paid the advisors separately on top of that. Um, we, you know, we're supporting over 100 farmers in, in restoration actions. And all the while we were feeding lessons and working with the Department of Agriculture and others on how we can develop a results-based approach in the CAP strategic plan for Ireland. And as as you will know, that that's now a reality, I guess, and we have this ACRES cooperation project approach, which covers uh, most, uh, well, all of the uplands, they are most of, depending on, on your definition. But um, there's about 89% of the Natura 2000 terrestrial Natura 2000 lands in the Acres Cooperation Project model, which is delivered on the ground by eight local led teams uh, on a results based payment for a uh, model for 20,000 farmers, or it might be quite 20,000 in it yet, I think maybe 17, but there'll be up to 20,000 after France too, um, is, is um, opened and, and subsequently farmers are signed up. So it's it's massive. There's 1.1 million hectares of land in the results-based program now with 20,000 farmers. So, and all those farmers have a budget that for results-based payments capped at 7,000 per year over five years, but also a budget for restoration actions and landscape scale actions as well. So we've got this massive opportunity now in Ireland for delivering conservation and restoration you know, at a national scale and integrating all our different land use policies so that we can deliver on all our objectives and all our targets across water, biodiversity, climate, nature, etc. Um, and uh, I think it's it's a huge it's a huge thing like we're we're at the forefront in Europe of this results based model and the European Commission are very interested in rolling it out to other other places in Europe as well. So, um, of course, with opportunity comes comes um, some kind of uh, additional additional work needed to capitalize on that. And the farmers in this program, in the Acre CP program, have got had their land scored. They've over four hundred thousand hectares of commonage land scored, um, as well as private lands. And in the next few weeks, nobody knows when. I don't think, but the farmers will get their results for um, 2023 so for the first time these 20,000 farmers will you know be getting told what their land is worth in terms of its ecological value which will it'll do a couple of things but one thing it'll do when the dust settles on it it'll drive a fairly substantial demand for restoration and especially on issues on colleges where there's kind of big problems that are you know long-standing and very expensive and complex to address you know massive areas of erosion or whatever it may be on on the, the top of a mountain and all that 
Um, and like we know from our own project from Hin Harry or Pearl Muscle others that um, you know, a lot of farmers that enter the results-based programs, they'll kind of there's some some level of apathy, I suppose. They'll sit on their score and they'll get whatever their payment and their score is and they'll kind of settle with it. But there'll be 15 to 20 percent will go looking to take actions or to get support for actions to improve it. So even if you have only 10% of the farmers who want to do an action to improve the ecological condition every year, that's 2,000 farmers uh, every year. So it's a huge, it's a huge um, demand and it's a huge opportunity, in fact, for you know, new, a new rural economy in many ways for restoration, conservation, restoration uh, work for, for delivering uh, those actions for people. So... I guess that's that's where we've been and where we're going when I said the second phase is we're looking in our project to see, well, how can we now build on this acre CP model, this results-based model, in order to try and meet this demand and to deliver a kind of restoration that we know will work for farmers because they'll get improved, you know, scores and payments. And we know will work for the environment because you know, you're doing you're doing the restoration work, which has been, you know, on the actual practical restoration work. It's well, well developed, I think. And, you know, there's a good few example sites of how to do it. Um, so along with the, you know, the other things of like provision of advice to the acre CP teams and to helping them assisting with surveying some common edge lands. I guess some of the more complex stuff we're involved in is the development of restoration action plans for sites and establishment of demonstration farms and sites. So, you know, like farmers, they need to see what, what restoration looks like, what conservation looks like in, a, in an area that looks like the area they farm. So there's no point in talking to them in a community center or whatever about water table management. They need to get out on the ground, see a farmer that has it done, talk to the farmer, ask them, you know, what their fears, concerns, opportunities, benefits, etc. And that's where you get the real, you know, interaction that farmers talking to farmers, telling them about their experiences will drive other farmers to copy or to change or ad adapt as well, you know. So they really, there's a huge opportunity there for um, developing a network of demonstration farms. So no farmer has to travel too far to see, well, what does road or control look like? Or what does drain management look like? Or what does a riparian margin look like in practice? You know, so, so we're looking to develop those, those demonstration farms with farmers and also uh, large scale restoration projects. So obviously the common agriculture policy cannot fund everything and it can only go so far, but you know, having that results-based mechanism there those provide an opportunity for, I guess, an entry for a restoration. But the, a lot of times it's outside what the budget of the common agriculture policy will allow. So farmers have three and a half thousand per year. So 17 and a half thousand or so over five years for restoration. But um, it's it's it'll only go so far, especially when you start looking at the bigger issues on uh, common age lands in particular. So what we're looking is to bring in additional funding from outside of the common agriculture policy to help assist with delivering these restoration plans. Um, I'll just give you one example of work we're doing in Waterland. So this is one place where we've leveraged another 2.1 million. We have about we have about 30 million actually additional funding got over the course of our, our project over the first three years as it stands already. So we're doing quite well. And bringing in the money, having the capacity to spend it actually is is one of our issues now. But we have a site in Waterlands. There's 600 uh, hectares where we're storing. So Waterlands is a project funded by the Horizon 2020 program, and we're doing delivering restoration via the results based model there. So we're working with over 150 farmers, um, on on six different sites, but even one particular site in the south. Um, on the south there and the southwest at Anschlevenir and it's about 220 hectares but we're talking about more than 1 million euros to do the restoration works on that site so at the minute we've been talking to the shareholders and they're all on board for us to develop a restoration action plan etc so we have that almost completed now and we're doing training with the farmers on what restoration looks like and different techniques 
um, we'd be presenting the restoration action plan to them. And if they agreed to go ahead with the restoration, we'd be ordering materials and we'll be away. But the idea is that we'll be hiring in the farmers as a local labour source to actually do the restoration work. So they will be putting in the timber dams and the, the logs, core logs or whatever, putting down the geotextile, whatever it may be, and they'll be getting paid a, a labour rate for doing the restoration work on their own lands if, if they're interested, like if not... We'd be looking for local labour from, from outside the community anyway. So we're doing a, a huge amount of monitoring on that site as well in terms of vegetation, um, water, climate monitoring, so that we can get the empirical data to show what improvements in ecological condition are delivered and use that information then to drive investment in restoration and to hopefully look for higher payments for ecosystem services for farmers. If we can show the restoration is delivering X amount of reductions in carbon emissions, for example, then we can use that to say, well, farmers should be getting paid more for delivering here, you know, so we can quantify the um, environmental services being delivered better. So I think the more data there we have, the, the better we can use it to the advantage of bringing in additional funding. The other aspect, of course, is who, who's going to do the work. I talked about farmers, training farmers to do the work, but we also have another project called Nature Communities where we're supporting uh, locally led teams in, to deliver conservation and restoration. So it's pretty much the same idea, but we um, it's 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 local led conservation and restoration to do the work on, their, on the SACs in their area. So it involves training, communication, regulatory issues etc so we have our first pilot site which is called the Doonera project and they're based in um the well forum connemara have won the tender for that and they're doing work in in uh, south connemara north connemara and south mayo so there's 10 10 lads there working full-time involved in sac restoration so they're most started off on rhododendron control and now they're moving into other peatland restoration techniques like ones I, I spoke about. So um, we'd funded you know, them to do a certain amount of work. But since they have got set up, they have won contracts, one with National Parks to do some restoration works in the Connemara National Park and one with Quilcha to do restoration work on Quilcha site. So there's huge demand for this type of work, you know, and others like uh, Quilcha Nature are planning to to 16,000 hectares of forest of bog over the next 20 years. So there's, there'll be no shortage of work once these projects start to come on stream. So that was our first pilot site. We've two new sites established, one in North Mayo and one up in North Donegal and Donalui. And these guys in Connemara have came and trained those, those you know, their kind of sister projects in the other areas on the work that they're doing on the whole process of how to get, you know, everything from getting your insurance to getting your, you know, your tax and your labor kind of laws and, you know, to your more kind of hands-on restoration approaches, et cetera. So sharing that knowledge among each other. So again, it provides additional capacity to build on the acres program and to be able to deliver this restoration work. So we're hoping to roll out this kind of model across the country to all the Blankenbog Natura 2000 sites so that everybody would have a locally based workforce that they could call on to do do the work when when required. So it's a huge, again, a huge opportunity for employment in rural Ireland as well. I, I won't I won't spend time on this because I see I'm I'm running out of time, but um just just might be of interest of what we're doing, you know. Someone will probably ask me questions if I don't mention it now. What are you doing about turf cutting or that? But we have this uh, other pilot project running as part of the Natura Communities Programme, which is looking at turf cutting in SACs. And we're developing a retrofitting programme that links turbury rights or somehow, maybe not limited turbury rights, we're still working on the details, but turbury rights in an SAC to a home energy retrofit. So if you've got turbury rights in the SAC, you can come in to this pilot and you can get your house retrofitted so that you reduce the need for turf as a solid fuel to, to heat your home. So it takes away the demand essentially for turf. And then we're looking that in return, we do restoration on the turbury plot and uh, potentially to revo revoke uh, uh, the turbury rights, but I'm not sure what the legal issues are there, but it's something that we're looking into. 
So again, this addresses several kind of national and EU policies, including the Habitats Directive and, you know, court cases against Ireland and infringement case for failing to stop turf cutting on SACs, which we're facing big fines for, um, as well as the Climate Action Plan, Air Quality Plan, Energy Poverty, Rural Development, etc. So again, we would see huge potential in this kind of voluntary model where, and again, a huge potential investment in rural Ireland where you have local teams going around retrofitting the houses so that, you know, people actually don't need to be burning turf to stay warm because their houses are so well insulated that they already are nice and warm. So I guess it's a watch this space, but we've got we've got four houses so far in the pilot and we're just working through kind of the intricacies and the, the, the nuances and finding out where the kind of speed bumps are, et cetera. And of course, the, the financing is a big issue. The, the country has plenty of money, I suppose, at the minute, but it won't always be the case. And we do have a three billion, you know, nature restoration fund since the last budget, et cetera. But we're also looking to develop other kind of finance models so that we're not just relying on state funding to deliver the restoration. So how do we bring new money into the system that's not common agriculture policy money, that's not government money? So we've got a, a couple of things on the go there as well about developing financing. And then we also linking this results-based program and this kind of, you know, this this verification of ecological quality to other actions within our projects. So we have a schools program where we've got a, a you know, a schools version of a scorecard where the children themselves go to their local bog and they assess the quality using the scorecard and look at threats and pressures and they go through all that, et cetera. We've got farmer knowledge exchange groups where the farmers are discussing the different issues that come up in the scorecards and how to best address them. We go around, visit different sites, et cetera. We're making a document with RTE to kind of showcase life in the uplands and the rural um, economy, et cetera, and, you know, trying to promote more support for investment in these areas, et cetera, and tourism, et cetera. So we've got, you know, there's about 75 project actions as well, then, but we, we try to link them one way or the other, most of them back to this kind of results-based model. And again, you know, there's so many different factors to consider from your ecology to your agriculture, land use, your social, cultural, finance, management, admin, et cetera, and linking all those together and then all the different actors who are involved here from government and state agencies to academics in NGOs, CSOs, farmers, landowners, business industry, bringing all those together and then linking the actors with all those different multi dimensions as well. And of course, it gets very complicated, but I mean, it's the, it's the only way to go as far as we would see which kind of brings us back around to our approach of bringing these different factors of policy, practice and place together to deliver on our objective of high quality habitats that work for people and the environment. Shane, <laughs> if you're still awake. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Gary. Um, now, um, Pat, do, do you want to follow that now or will we go into a general discussion? I, I, I won't take much more time because I'm, I'm conscious of the time and it's ten to nine. But just a, just a couple of comments, and we'll go into general discussion then on it. And the first thing I like about your project is that it's a nine-year project, mm. which is about half of what it should be. Because I think these projects, when they go to that, should be a kind of maybe a twenty-year project or four or five-year projects that people want to go into and stay into because nothing is achieved in five years and that. The other thing I wanted to, to mention that leapt out to me was SACs. And we have an awful problem in this country with SACs, where there is restrictions placed on farmland and very, very strict restrictions placed with no payment whatsoever for it. When they came in first, we were given a payment for SACs and told we would continue to get an SAC payment. But now we're told if we're doing acres and lots and that, that, we, that we're getting paid already for doing the same actions. So you can get paid twice for doing the same thing. Which, of course, is not true, because if that's on your land, it's a big, big restriction in your land. It's a restriction in your land. I know one guy was trying to sell land. Half it was SAC. The other half wasn't. He sold to half that wasn't, and he couldn't even get a bid for the SAC land on it. And there has to be a payment brought in first to all SAC lands, and the payment has to be there. It has to be index-linked, and it has to be there as long as the, S uh, as, as the restriction is on the land. And when the... It says when the payment stops, the restriction stops on the land. And that's not that's not that's not too much to ask on it at all. The other thing 
we're looking at there very, very quickly is uh, your scorecards. And you're, we're bringing in a scorecard, and we're trying to bring in the same standard scorecard for all of Ireland. And we know from looking at different projects, if we look at one, one, one of the world-famous projects, I suppose, was the, the Born Life program. And they came in and they started doing their scorecards. And they improved every year and improved every year. And it was a fantastic, it was, it was a fantastic result. Then we look at the Sioux scheme in Wicklow, where the scores stayed the same. The scores just didn't lift at all like it did in the Bourne. And people might say that the farmer was happy with the score he had. I know some of the farmers up there, and they're very enthusiastic farmers, and they tried hard to improve their score, and they couldn't. And the basic reason for that is land type. And as we go around the country for all this, we see totally different land types, and we see the same scorecard to control all of those. On it. And 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 another thing with with the scorecard and acres, I I I know a guy who was there and he was waiting in a bad, desperate year that we had, and he got an opportunity to cut his silage, and he cut silage, and they came the following day to score his his land, and he got zero for it. They told him if he left a two meter strip around the headland, that could have been that could have been scored, and he could have got that. But this guy has very little downland, and he wanted every bale he could get on it. I do believe there's a chance that he can do it next year, and if he scores next year, he he can get it back. The thing with, 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 with these is when these schemes are being brought in and, and all the schemes, the farmer is brought into it too late. The scheme is there first and you're asked, do you want to join? Whereas at the very, at, 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 at the very, very start, when this thing is being planned for sale by people, there should be, a, the, 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 there should be a, a farming base in that. And some of that money should be spent to people like, say, IFA, the biggest farming association in the country, to employ somebody out of that money, to go in and put a farmer's point of view on it, report back to, to the farmers and feed back into it what's good and what isn't doing in it. And um, I, I, I don't want to take too much time. So you go ahead with your questions and we'll jump in anyway as we're going along. Okay, thanks very much, Pat. So listen, um, Gary, that point there about the development of the scorecards. So the ones that you're using now are, are similar to those used for the Pearl Mustard Project, the Hen Harrier Project. To what extent did you modify those for your life integrated project? So for us, we, we effectively took the the scorecard that was developed in the Pearl Muscle Project and used a very similar uh, system. And there was a couple of good reasons for that. Um, one, it was it was developed for a similar habitat type, so it was already adapted for that, that kind of context. Number two, the person who led the development of the scorecards in the Pearl Muscle Project is Derek McLaughlin, who is now the manager of the Wide Atlantic Nature Project. So he was the one who had the expertise and had worked with the farmers and others on the development of those scorecards anyway. And uh, probably mo most important maybe was the fact that we were looking at the cap cycle and we were our project started in January 2021 and we were looking to so in our in our project proposal over the nine years, the initial proposal was to start a results based payment uh, scheme pilot in year four and run it for five years to year nine and then wrap it up. So essentially, the pilot was going to finish when the project was finishing and everyone was out the gap and no one to take it up and bring it on, et cetera. And at that stage, you would have already missed two cap cycles, the 2023 to 2027 and 2028 or whatever. So our feeling was, well, if we want to influence cap and see, can we, um, you know, get something better for farmers here, we need to bring this right back to front and center to the beginning of the project. So mm -hmm. To go starting, so we 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 started the project January 2021, and we had 167 farmers signed up for an agri environment program by June of that year, which was no mean feat considering it was level five COVID lockdown as well as everything else um, that was that was potentially going against you. So, so in that respect, I think it, it could be well justified that we didn't spend as long. Um, adapting a scorecard that we already knew was working very well in the Pearl Muscle Project and that farmers were happy with in the Pearl Muscle Project, etc. And we went after more of the kind of policy 
side and also I guess the implementation of the results based at the landscape level so targeting the entire SEC rather than just you mm-hmm. know people bordering a Pearl Muscle River or whatever it may be that that you know is more selective of who came into the likes of the Pearl Muscle so what we did is we looked at our system our IT system our administration system and everything else and we always designed that with the ambition of it being delivered at scale. So we knew that we would have 800 odd farmers in the program, but we designed a system that could accommodate 80,000 or 180,000 or whatever farmers. So when we were getting people to build an IT system, et cetera, we said build one that can take, you know, 50,000 people, whatever, even though we knew we wouldn't have them, but we knew that we could demonstrate to the Department of Agriculture and others that this can be done at scale using the model that we're using here. So, so there's some of the the reasons for that, but um, essentially at the scorecards, like the farmers were very happy with it, you know, and we did get their, their input going along. We made some changes um, based on some feedback for the farmers in, in implementation, et cetera. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Um, just one, one, I think one or two queries, I suppose. Um, it, the project is very, very good in environmental baselines, you know, both um, your SACs and your farm management sort of systems. To what extent do you have a sociological baseline? Have you, have you, have you, you know, have you, have you got uh, information on, um, um, you know, farm employment or income, local income? Um, have you done questionnaires? Have you had, um, workshops you know your your baseline your sociological baseline yeah so what i mean there's a lot of secondary data already available we already know what farm incomes in the area we know the type of farming etc um it did do a it did do a survey of farmers that participate in our program um there was uh over 320 farmers completed that survey so um we got good data there we are working in um in the Waterland project on a social science um aspect in there. So there's a a um full work package dedicated to that, and we um are planning next year as well to do a socioeconomic evaluation project that'll be starting hopefully in in January or early next year. So. We um there's lots of opportunity there. And of course, like I'm a social scientist by training myself, my PhD is in environmental social science. So it's something I'm very keen in. And I think that it's something that that's vitally important. All right. But I mean, there's there's so much that can be done there um as as well, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. No, I was interested to know the boundaries of your study areas. You know, okay, your SSEs, they're your principal interest. And then you broaden that out to include the, the catchments. So that was kind of relevant to the, the freshwater pearl mussel. Mm-hmm. So to what extent were you were you linking into communities or sort of settlements in those areas? You know, and that these farm communities, the, the farmers, they're parts of communities that, that um, you know, that have all sorts of other economic activities and interests, uh, tourism, for example. You know, so your boundary boundary of your study areas seem to be just to do with environmental um criteria. Um yeah, no, I well I wouldn't I wouldn't agree there, but like Fall Charland are a partner on the project and we we um will be running community tourism workshops uh, next year with Fall to Ireland. They're, you know, working on a second draft of a report on sustainable tourism access in the uplands and um mm-hmm. Uh, etc so that'll be published next year and on the back of that we'll be running workshops with lo- local communities across the project area um you know we're working with the heritage council um on schools programs so we've ran a, a schools program piloted in uh last year with 12 schools and now that's opened up to all the schools across the project area as well um we're working um with plenty of others like the ETB and Solus and developing training programs um, in conservation, restoration, management, et cetera. 
So, I mean, we've got, like I spoke there about the results-based program and the restoration of that. So the results-based program is one action in our project. Well, it's two actions. One is the preparation and one is the implementation, but it's two out of 75 or so actions. So we've got about 70 other things going as well as about 15 complementary projects. So there's, there's a lots of stuff happening, I guess. So what you would have got there in the presentation is, is a snapshot um, of of what's happening in the project. And we could give a presentation, a full presentation on, on the tourism aspect or the heritage aspect or, or the sociocultural aspect or whatever whatever else as well. So there's plenty happening. And I guess it's 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 worth remembering as well that, or I certainly remind myself that we're less than three years into a nine year project and we've done a fair bit. And I know we have a lot more to do, but the results-based program took up so much of everybody's time for the first, you know, two and a half years of the project that there was only so much headspace and so much hours in the week as well for kind of going going after other other interests. But you know, I I take your point for sure that there's loads more we need to be looking at, and we are linking in with several universities, researchers, different organizations. You know, I mean, this is already my third presentation this week to different organizations, and there's not a week goes by that we don't have emails from different people looking to link up on different stuff. So, thanks, Gary. Listen, has anyone else got a question? Sorry about this, dear drive. Dominated things here now. Uh, no, could could I ask a question, Mary? Thanks very much. No, it's great, fantastic presentation, Gary. Thanks so much, and uh, delighted to hear the range of stuff that's been addressed. And I think, in fairness, you know, many of the uh, concerns that Pat raised seem to be, uh, you know, you're all, you're addressing them in, in one way or another. My question was really about the commonages. Uh, could I ask, um, you know, if you have a commonage with with 25 people or, you know, whatever number of people participating or owning the commonage, how do you deal with if there's one person who doesn't participate in the common, you know, if one person says, no, I don't want to be part of that. Can you actually address the commonage and include in the project or most of all whatever yeah. commonage owners about? I oh, know, great, great question, great question. I mean, there's some of the most interesting and challenging um aspects is working with commonages, but uh, there's never a dull moment for sure. So in terms of the actual results-based program and including commonages in that. If a farmer has a share in the commonage and he came into our results-based program, then the commonage gets scored as long as there's any shareholder in. So what we would do, say the commonage is a uh, hundred hectares in size and it's got 10 shares, then we would score the commonage and then you know there's a payment per hectare and say the payment for argument's sake is, is a thousand euros so every share in the commonage is 100 euros. So if you have four farmers in the program, they get 100 euros each. And if the other six farmers aren't, then they just don't get paid. The money goes back into the system for delivering you know, to other farmers who are in. So, so you don't benefit by keeping your neighbor out, but... <laughs> but you don't stay out by, by your neighbor not coming in. So that's one aspect of it. So you can still get the payment. Now, the other aspect is actually if a farmer wants to, or some farmers want to do restoration works on the commonage and, and others don't. So essentially the long and short of it is if a, if a, one of the commonage shareholders object to the works, then it just won't happen. That's it. You know, um, you're going nowhere, but we do have some, I mean, we don't, tend to give up that easy like what we would do is for farmers that are interested we look at setting up common uh, management groups mm -hmm. so we start off by getting all the shareholders together to attend meetings to discuss the issues what potentially could be done and we pay them to come to those meetings as part of their you know um their participation in the common edge management group now, if there's someone who is just not for turning and they're saying, I, I'm objecting, that's it, then that's it. You know, we've other places to go and plenty to keep us going, but it's a shame. But you don't tend to get that too often. You'll get some people that won't, uh, just won't say anything rather than being, you know, actively objecting, you know. So 
like farmers, we found farmers absolutely brilliant to work with. I must say that. I mean, there's no, there's been no issue. Most of the problems we run into are within our own department or their, whatever, you know. So the farmers the, are, are are brilliant to work with, you know. And you know, in general, we're we're welcomed with with open arms, and you know, particularly in in some areas of the country where they see someone coming looking to do for work work and pay work and restoration and you know drive investment in the community some of them you know think it's a, no, a no-brainer really so yeah we we found it brilliant great thanks guy okay um i see vincent has asked one in the in the chat there as well just in case anyone is listening he just said um did Gary, yep, go ahead. There you are. Do you want to read out the question yourself? Uh, Vincent, yeah, better. Gary, yeah, fair play. I was going to ask the one in the commonage. I'm a commonage shareholder over here in the mornings. Uh, and yeah, that's one of the, what's as you know, that's one of the big stumbling blocks to uh, fund the, uh, is that commonages are currently, our shared grazing is currently uh, out. Uh, yeah, so I uh, often used phrase in, in this type of habitat restoration work is public money for public goods and uh, i just couldn't uh, i couldn't help notice that you didn't use that once and so the question was was that a conscious omission yeah well it's a fair fair question if you had said was re-wetting a conscious admission i would say yes but public <laughs> money public money for public goods i don't have a problem with actually i think that's fine and um you know, there are so many different phrases for the same thing. Public money for public goods, actually, in the continent would be a phrase they'd use a lot in Germany and that, mm-hmm. um, you know, payments for ecosystem services, they call, you know, so there's loads of different phrases for the same, but I, I don't have an issue. No, it's, it's as simple as that. I don't have an issue. It's just whatever language. I do, I do, I am definitely conscious that language is very important and the, the language that we use is is really, really important and you need to be careful and not kind of be throwing around phrases willy nilly uh, and all that, you know. Um, but but that particular one, public money for public goods, I think that makes sense, you know. That does what it says on the tin, so I'd be ha- happy to use that. Before I let uh, Helen shout, yeah, going by your pedigree, I guess that every word was fairly well chosen. Uh, and uh, suffice to say, uh, yeah, I'll definitely try to catch up with you, uh, Gary. I'm really interested in the training programs. And also on the commonage chat, so uh, you might get an email. And uh, oh, absolutely, yeah! I'll put my email in the chat there, and you can please do. Yeah, thanks very much. Cheers, Gary. Thanks, Vincent. Okay, folks. Um, I think we might wrap up now. Sorry, Mary. Helen has her hand up there for a while. Okay, sorry, Helen. Go ahead. Helen, you're on mute. Thanks, dear. Just sorry about that. Um, Gary, did I pick you up right? Did you say that uh, only 10 to 15 percent of the 800 odd farmers participating are taking on actions? And I'm wondering, is that because the money is not enough to incentivize them or because they're too old to do the work? Or are they, um, I suppose, where that really leads is, well, why do you think they aren't taking it up? And then is the program itself going to improve the conservation status of the land if the incentive to improve is not working? Yeah, great, great questions. A couple of very important um, things there and, and stuff that we don't know that we're looking at and, you know, uh, other aspects. But so, you know, from our project and others, yeah, the, the uptake in the in the results based programs is generally very high, like well over 80 percent. But then when it comes to actually applying for funding for restoration actions, it tends to be about 15 percent or thereabout kind of across the projects people have found. So um, there's a couple of things there. And you've mentioned some of them, but I guess we don't have good evidence on on why farmers aren't taking up. But uh, one thing that I would say that's very important is that the farmers can make changes themselves without coming to the project team for support for those changes. So whereas if a farmer wants to do some works that involves, you know, some infrastructure changes like a livestock crossing or, you know, some works that'll be expensive like rhododendron control or whatever 
they're likely to come to the project team for those. But if a farmer, you know, based on, you know, now getting payments by results and based on the education, awareness, the training, et cetera, that all goes with that, um, you know, farmers can do things like changes in stock management, like uh, levels of stock, stock rotation, you know, have them on the hills for different times, different periods, let the hills rest. Uh, changes in fertilizer, you know, different amounts of fertilizer, put it out different, different um at different times of the year, keeping back from water course, whatever it may be. And they don't necessarily need to come to the project for for support to make those changes. So we know we know what farmers are applying to the projects for and what type of actions, but we don't have good data on what type of changes farmers are making to practices on their own initiative without coming to the project. We've good anecdotal evidence to say that's happening. All right, but um, but we don't. But we are in that waterlands project that that I mentioned. The key focus there is looking at how we drive greater uptake in restoration among farmers, and also the efficacy of different actions in terms of the environmental and social returns on them. And what we found is actually when you go to the farmers and engage and explain that there's it increases uptake exponentially. So. In the Waterlands project right now, the uptake in restoration actions is 100%, believe it or not, among among the, the farmers that our team has approached. And that is uh, over 80 farmers, so 82 farmers. And they had to stop, stop calling to farmers because everybody wanted in. So I don't know, is it just the farmers in the Kulka and Iran or whatever? But, you know, we so we're already learning lessons that actually when you go talk to the farmers, first thing they would do is they would meet them in, walk the land with them, show them the issues, discuss what they might do, ask the farmer first, what would you do here? And then say, well, here's some things we can help with, et cetera. And, and every farmer so far has said, yes, sign, sign me up, you know, which is incredible. So there's huge learnings there. And that's why I say there's a huge opportunity now for delivering restoration through the results-based program, but it does take a lot of work and, and time and effort, but absolutely worth doing and huge benefits for, for farmers and the environment, as I said. So do you see it improving the conservation status other than outside uh, sleep, uh, Quilka and Erin, where you've got a phenomenal response rate? Oh, I think so. I think even having the results-based program and having even that, like if you think about 20,000 farmers that go to training on environmental awareness, scorecard use, how to identify threats and pressures, to know what a 10 out of 10 landscape looks like, what does good ecological condition look like, it's a complete change of mindset for the farmers when they walk away from those training sessions. Like we've seen it seen it ourselves and again I suppose back to Mary's point, like there's a whole uh, piece of work to be done there um, you know, getting in depth in terms of uh, find, finding out the the changes from a psychology and a so sociology perspective and and everything else, you know. So there's, oh, yeah. Look, it, it it was a fantastic presentation, Gary. Um, it's a huge amount more we could talk about, but uh, I'm conscious uh, we're probably over time here. But thank you very much. No, thanks, Helen. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Gary. Um. Yeah, listen, we are we are nearly uh, out of time, aren't we, Deirdre? Um, just one last thing, Gary, if you don't mind. When you were talking at, at the start of your talk, you mentioned about the current situation, you know, with the uplands is is a result of conflicting policies. Um, and you spelt out, you know, quite a few of them. But the reality is farmers are blamed. Farmers are blamed for the overgrazing. Farmers are blamed if the hills are burnt. And I'd love you and this, you know, whenever you get this opportunity to make that point about the the the, the poor quality of 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 um policies and the the potential for conflicting policies um and and the need to resolve that. And hopefully your nine year integrated integrated um, life project will 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 sort that out yeah no we we are we're working hard on that aspect mary for sure it's something we spend quite a bit of time time doing at, at the european and irish level you know all the all the way um working on the policy side of it because you know it's all right doing things that will have 
change on, on the short term or on the small scale. But if you want to target long term, large scale, then you look you need to look at the drivers behind that. And they often are related to policy uh, decisions, which, you know, are often taken without considering what what happens on the ground, you know. And I guess farming and the uplands is a special case that needs special policies that reflect that and not to be, um, you know, trying to operate under the same policy framework as something like dairy farming or tillage farming, you know, so it just doesn't make sense if that's for that. Yeah. Thanks very much, Mary. Thanks, Mary. Mary, could I just come in there finally? Um, first, I want to thank Gary very much and Pat for your time and efforts. That was fantastic. Um, I just want to, to note, I'm not sure if you're able to see my screen share at the moment. I'm not sure if it's showing up, but uh, just to say this was the final uh, of our autumn webinar series. And all, all our events are available on our website. So we've recorded uh, each of the sessions. So if you've missed any of them, go to irishuplandsforum.org, um, click the events and you'll see the, the uh, recordings there. You can listen back to them in your own time. And finally, I'd just like to say that um, this series has been part of uh, Heritage Council funding. And we very much like to thank our funders, the Heritage Council, for their support in delivering this series through the year. So um, thanks again very much, Gary. And it was a real pleasure to, to hear about the programme tonight. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, thanks Deirdre. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Have a nice evening. OK. Cheers, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Ron, Thanks a lot. Bye-bye now. Hi Jim. Oh, I see. Jean is there as well. Yeah. Did you did you enjoy the the evening, uh, Jim? <laughs>